we have, we are very fortunate to have, had, we have here present three American legends. Mr. Desmond Murphy, Mr. Bill Shelton, and Mr. Ed Bidden. We're very fortunate to be here in the Philippines, and they were willing to give us a seminar. Imagine having the three legends of the dog world in America here with us. So I don't think I need to introduce Mr. Vivin too much. Everyone knows the name, Vivin. In Japan, they call him Edo. Edo Vivin, he is from America, so you all know. He's uh, a dog world person. He's a Pomeranian expert. Uh, he's one of the living legends of uh, Synology. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ed Vivin. Rather difficult, <coughs> rather difficult to follow that uh, introduction and to be placed in the company of, of these two. Dinky, I appreciate very much the opportunity to come talk about a breed that I have either been directly or indirectly involved with for 65 years. So I've seen many stages of Pomeranians around the world and in America, but I'm going to take a minute to ask you to remember something. We were anticipating tonight there being maybe 20 people here, and that we would be in a small room, and that we would have an intimate discussion, so to speak, about two or three breeds. Obviously, the rules have been changed. So we're in a large group. You're wonderful to come listen to what we have to say. But we, I am going to ask you to keep the private conversations down as much as you can. Because if you talk over here, it affects these people over here from hearing what we're trying to do. So if you'll just keep that in mind for us, and remember we've got outside noise here too. We'll make the best of it. That's what it's about. Uh, the, 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 the professor comes out in me once in a while, and I ask that, that you remember those things for the consideration and out of respect for the people who are here, not so much for me, okay? Um, as I said, I started looking at Pomeranians and I bought my first one almost 65 years ago. And the breed was considerably different. Both standards today, the AKC and the FCI standard, they talk about a square breed. It is absolutely square. And that is required in every standard that I've ever seen. The FCI standard, which is the basis for what we will be judging here, if this is an FCI show and we try to do our best to proceed along those lines, really does not deviate from the American standard as much as you might think when you put the two down and look at the intent and the purpose of the two standards. Both make obvious awareness of it being a Nordic breed and that there are certain characteristics that go along with that breed. That it is square, that the ears should be highly placed on the head, you want a small ear, if possible. And the FCI standards says, I believe, that, that placement is more important than size. But you do remember that a, 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 a smaller ear is more desirable. We've always had problems with ears in the breed, as long as I've been around, and I think they probably go back far longer than I do. Uh, there are some other problems that came into the breed during the period of time in which I bred and exhibited the breed. The dog breed was square. Uh, a very famous woman in, in Texas who bred a lot of Pomeranians and did it very successfully brought out one dog that was longer in body, shorter on leg, and with a lower set ear and a different eye than a lot of the breeds that we had seen. And that dog was heavily used because he was a very heavy coated dog, heavily coated dog. And he was, he, he was sound, as sound as he could be for that. 
but that really had an influence on the breed in America. I don't see that influence as much in Europe as I see it, uh, as, I, as I'm aware of it in, in America. The, the FCI standard does not separate the Spitz types and make it into four or five different breeds. It makes them all the same and it calls the smallest of all of those given as being the Pomeranian. Now Pomeranians came primarily originally, of course, from Germany out of, out of a larger Nordic breed. And I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but, but Queen Victoria became a very significant fancier of Pomeranians. Today, both of our standards call for a dog that ranges it me, from about seven pounds down to really around five to four as being most desirable. The size is approximately the same. I would think that the European dog is a little bit taller maybe than, than a lot of our dogs in America. But that's because of that American influence of a long and low dog who was heavier in bone and heavier in head. And we still see that in a lot of American dogs. There are some of us old folkies, so to speak, who do not like that. We like a more square dog, and we like a little bit more foxiness in the face, and, and, and a better ear placement. We think those things are essential. I'm going to talk about some things that some of you are not going to want to listen to. Among those being a very sad situation that we see today, and what has happened to coats. And I say it's sad because it is. We, th there are a number of things that are being done. I agree with what Bill said and certainly in what Desi said, that presentation has a whole lot to do with the perception of a breed. But both of the standards, well, the FCI standard, I don't think really allows technically any trimming except of the body coat or reshaping. The American standard says that you may reshape, or slight, not reshape, but you may really just clean up with a minimal amount of trimming the shape of the dog or for, for just neatness as much as anything. But what has happened is that we've all become victim of a, of a little malady called black skin disease. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Uh, black skin disease was present 65 years ago when I bought the first one. It is not a new thing. It has been in Pomeranians for many years, but it was not prevalent at that time. And we referred to it at that point as being elephantitis. It was not called black skin disease, but the same symptoms prevailed. There were people who bred to it, some never paid any attention to it. I never bred to it. But of the lions that were present, it was known that it was probably more heavily carried in some lions than it was in others. And it, there, I think that there are certain awarenesses of black skin disease or the potential for it in puppies up to about six months of age. When you judge Pomeranians and you look at them on the table, if you will look down the center of the back, you will notice that a puppy frequently has a different texture of hair down the center of the back compared to what he has on the other part of the body. The dogs that maintain the same fluffy undercoat type coat, undercoat type coat, are the dogs that later are more prone to be affected by black skin. Now remember that. I believe it is the FCI standard and the American standard that both talk about the difference between a puppy coat and uh, up, up to a certain stage as being a soft, fluffier coat. At no point in my opinion up past about four or five months should you ever see the absence of significant guard hair. 
There are some things that are common in all Spitz breeds, among those being a double coat. And I'm a purist. I'm offended when you remove half of the coat on a double coated breed and you expect me to accept it. I'm not going to do it. It's a double coated breed. It must have the guard hair. Because if you blew this dog up that weighs five pounds and he weighed 50 pounds and you put him out in the snow, there are a couple things that would be very essential for him. One would be enough length of muzzle to allow the air to warm before it hit his lungs. That's one of the reasons that you have the shape of a head that you have in any of the Nordic breeds. They were not hot weather dogs, they were cold weather dogs. And the other thing that is so typical is the coat. And a third thing is the tail. And the tail is very significant in these breeds because it had a purpose and it was set as it was supposed to be. Let's go to the coat. You should, uh, coat is related to color, in my opinion. There are some colors in, in, in breeds, all of them, that carry what we call color link characteristics. In a black and tan Pomeranian, you do not often, if ever, get the same texture that you get in oranges and creams and some of the other colors. You get a little woolier coat. And if you put your hands on a Pomeranian and you feel the difference in the, t you feel the texture in the coat, please understand you must have a significant difference in the feel of the guard hair of the standoff coat and that which is is next to the skin called the undercoat. Any questions up to that point? I have one. Are there any wines in the world today that are breeding of black skin? Well, I, I don't, I don't, I no longer breed the breed Pomeranians. I am not aware. I do know that there are people who have significantly worked to get it out of their breed or out of their breeding and I think there are people who are less concerned about it but as far as I know the breed is fairly well smitten with black skin disease and you're seeing it in some of the other Nordic dogs now as well any other questions up to that point yes some people ask to me about the blue color in the Pomeranian. What you say? Blue color. Blue color? Yes. Well, as a kid, the, the American standard defined color better than it does today. Um, sables were defined. There were three colors of sable. One of them was the wolf sable, the gray sable. The other one was orange, and the other one was, I, I think, cream or red or whatever. Um, but we said that the, there was a black band of color in a sable. If you took a sable coat and parted it down, you would see a black band, which was the tip. And then you would see the significant color indication, be it wolf or whatever it was. And then down next to the skin, you got a grayish color or a, a, an off color of undercoat. Blues were acceptable as they are today in Pomeranians anyway. We, I, I have not seen many in my lifetime. I've seen some gorgeous ones. But blue is an acceptable color in America. And I don't see it as being uh, eliminated uh, in, in the FCI standard. Uh, both of those standards make reference to the color of the eye because of the introduction uh, in America of the uh, uh, Merrillian. And of course, with the Merrills, you have a tendency to get a blue flake in the eye or you get a blue eye. Okay. Remember that the coat is part of function. That if you, if, if you took the dog back to the purpose for which it was intended, 
it would have to have that kind of coat that I've described. You can't cut half of it off. I do understand that when you show dogs and you have a dog that suffers the black skin disease, it, it begins to, to the, the demise of the coat is on the rear end first. And a lot of you are prone, in my opinion, around the world, to trim the, the main coat, this is the body or the mane up here, to match what you don't have, rather than trying to grow it everywhere. Now, another area of trimming in a Pomeranian that is overdone today is the tail. Both standards are very specific about the, 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 the brush on the coat. When I was a kid, we had brushes on the coat that would come up to the ears. We don't see that very much because the tails have become shorter, not as long as they used to be, and they do not go up the back like they're supposed to. You have lower tail sets today than we had, and you have steeper croups today than we had. Both standards are very specific about the, the, the falling off of a croup, that it is not desirable. You want a croup on a Pomeranian to be basically flat with the tail high set into the croup, and that allows the tail to go straight up the back and you get the desired look that is sought after so far. When you don't have a good tail set and you have a low tail set, a lot of you are trimming around what I call ringing a tail, where you trim all the way around the tail. You haven't fooled anyone. Because what you've done is not <clears throat> emphasize anything that is positive, but you're emphasizing and making it more obvious what has occurred or what you're doing with the bad tail set. You show that the tail is lower set and you trim under the tail for some reason, I still don't understand, so that the tail comes out in an arch rather than going flat into the back. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Do you? Okay. Uh, feet should be trimmed. The edge or the, the, the end of the ear should be trimmed. And I have no objection because I did it myself. We would take a scissor and take off the rough edges, but not to reshape. But if you want to trim more than this old guy would, don't do it with a clipper. Don't do it with a straight line scissor. There is something made called a thinning shear that does it very nicely. And don't trim under the tail. Let that coat grow and you simply part it down the middle, brush it to each side, take the tail and blend it all together with a brush or a comb. And you get the same look. Any dog should maintain basically the same profile moving that he has standing. Pomeranians should not be long in loin. None of the rest of them should be. They should be longer in their length of rib and short in their loin. And then you get the tail coming up and it's, it's, it's really wonderful. A Pomeranian's a bit of an anomaly in the fact that it's a square dog, but because of the proper tail set and the head carriage, you get a very short back appearance. We do not have, uh, we, we, we don't have the refinement in the breed today that the English bred in, in the breed for many, many years. We have shorter legs, we have heavier bone, and they are very heavily coated. Now, that's not something that I particularly like because I don't think it goes with the rest of them. But it, it the American standard allows for it and really kind of encourages it. I don't know why. I think a few years ago they were having a lot of problems in patellas and in stifles, and they thought that a little heavier bone would be a sounder mover. 
and would, would help them in that nature. Uh, a square dog is a basically standard dog. It moves in a straight line. It moves with the with its, its leg reaching toward the center of gravity, both fore and aft, as it goes. And it's it's a simple breed to understand in regard to movement, that kind of thing. I I have a great passion for this breed, and uh, I, I I regret some of the things that have happened and have taken place. But those are the things that I see as being the essence of the breed. That which is required is the coat, the tail set, the carriage, and the squareness and body. Any other questions? Yes. Would you recommend, uh, what is your take on using hair? Oh, who are you trying to fool, me or yourselves? Uh, hairspray is used. It's used in a lot of breeds that it shouldn't be used in. I, I don't like it. I would much rather put my hand on a Pomeranian that had a natural coat that was harsh in the guard hair and had the, the feel that was correct rather than sprayed in. Uh, it offends me when I see people stand outside my ring and spray dogs in. I don't like it. But I'm a purist. And I'll die a purist. Any others? Yeah, Ed, why would the standard calls for a fox like expression? Why did so many breeders try to breed for the baby dog? It, it goes back to the influence of one kennel and one area. Um, they, they, they called it those sweet little faces or those this or that. Both standards call for either a fox-like or a foxy head and appearance. You get pretty chowy looking muzzles today in a lot of Pomeranians, and that's not right. Uh, but it goes with the heavier bone. And when people breed for the heavier bone, they're going to change what happens right here. Uh, when I was a kid, we had problems probably in the dominus in the skull as much as anything. Uh, the skulls are less domy today, but they're wider, and a wider skull will often lower the ear set. There are just some of those things that happen. Any other questions? Yes? The whiskers? Well, I, I don't have an objection to their being cut unless you're trying to take a chow muzzle and make it less chowy. Personally, I think dogs have whiskers for a purpose. It adds to their sensitivity, their sense of touch, all those things. So why take them off? Well, of course, I've never seen a fox with a trim whisker. Uh, but uh, I, I have no objection to your doing it. I just don't know why you do it sometimes. I do agree that it may slim a muzzle down a little bit and may take a little bit the squareness out of it. But I don't think taking whiskers off makes it look any more foxy. I really don't. The foxiness comes out of the shape of the head and the muzzle and the placement of the eye um, and the shape of the eye. Remember something, all eyes are round. When we talk about an oval eye, we're talking about the orifice, the opening of the eye. And as Pomeranians and all of these other breeds get old, those the, the, the orifice has a tendency to relax and you get a rounder appearance in the eye. There are certain lines in Pomeranians, even today, that carry a better eye than others. 
but I generally would say that those short-legged, heavy bone, heavy body, they have a tendency to carry around their eye. And it's because of the shape of the head that goes with it. Any, anything else? As, why did we change our standard on the bone? To want to go for the larger bone? Don't ask me. I don't know. I didn't vote for it, and I would never vote for it. What was their purpose, do you think? I, I think the purpose was that they felt if they got a little bit more bone, they had a greater chance of being sounder in movement. I don't agree with it. What would you prefer to forgive? Uh, a slightly more bone head with better gear, or more flatter with a slightly lower it, it, it depends a lot on the color of the dog, to be very frank with you. There are certain colors that look more misshapen with the wider skull. It, it, it's, not, it's not just the dome. There are things that go with that. And you have to ask yourself, where does that come from? What does it do to the rest of the dog? You generally speak, you do not see a square dog with a short back and all these things and the proper amount of bone, not heavy, that is too wide in here. Uh, I think ear set is very important in a Pomeranian because it, both standards talk about the alertness and the ability to respond and be involved in whatever. And if you get an ear that is down here on the side of the head, you, you don't get the same kind of facial reaction. You just don't get it. So I think I probably would take a little bit more dominus with the, you don't want a flat skull either, no, in any no. but I, I would take a little bit more dominus with a proper ear because then you're going to get a reaction that you want to see. Any others? Yes. Well, I, a, a lot of that has to do with the backstop. I mean, the back, the, the, the back skull, and with the uh, uh, stop. I think when you get a proper stop in a Pomeranian, which is very obvious really you don't get a down face it's when you get an absence of stop that you get the face coming down I think as you down faces are, are and Bill and I agree on this in, in dogs that the more down face you get you get a falling off under the eye and that greatly affects the whole expression Okay? Any others? Thank you very much. I, yeah, oh, wait, wait, wait. But going back to the bowling. Yes. Now, what if you get a dog with medium bone, right? And they blow up and cheat and they get all the bone and all that. Don't ask me. Because sometimes when you do it, sometimes when I'm judging you, I'll bowling. The bone is proper, but they make the bone look, I mean, the bone is just big. I mean, Desi and dogs, I've, I've been here 65 years, and I, I assure you that what Bill said about corgis or what you said about chows is applicable under this same condition. It's whoever reads the standard and what they interpret as being. And if you don't get the direction out of the parent clubs that you should get, that leaves it open to interpretation more than it is if you get a strong direction. And and the American standard says me, medium bone. And it talks about the coat on the leg and on, you know, whatever. And you, you get all of that together. Everybody trims today. And they, they should trim feet, but they leave all this hair on the back of the lower leg and it makes it look heavier 
instead of evening that out with with their scissor or taking a little of it out and, and making the dog it gives him leg it does all that i don't know why they did that. any others yes and i was uh, we were talking about tail set earlier about uh, what tail set uh, the, the tail set um when you judge a ball you go over from the side you normally put your hand on the butt on the, on the, on the butt and check for the tail set yes and correct me if i'm wrong when you put your hand behind the buttocks you should feel the tail protruding because it should fall flat should go yeah. flat so when you feel the tail when you go like this to the back this is the, this is the front this is the back when you feel this way and you feel the tail protruding it's a bad tail set right? well you have you basically yes basically that's right you, you have to do something else though you have to feel the line of the croup. You can't you can't talk about tail set in dogs if you don't talk about croups. But in feeling in feeling the back, as a judge, in feeling the back, you the tail set right. really in, in a bad tail set and a bad croup, you will you will generally find that the curve of the tail blocks your hand. Yes, yes. That's right. If, if you ever watch me judge Pomeranians, seldom do I judge them that I don't flip a tail back and put it back. I do. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. In Asia, what? Listen. In Asia, there are two types of Pomeranians. One from the very old UK line, which is prevalent in Japan and Taiwan, and the other, the more American type. No, don't use the term American type. <laughs> round the type. Round the don't type. use the term American type. Canadian. <laughs> so uh, the one that is from the old UK line, are more foxy, with more dark hair, less undercoat. Uh, what is your preferred type? Well, I'm, I'm going to take I'm going to take a square dog with a proper tail set and a proper back line. I'm not going to use, if I have any choice at all, a dog that is short on leg, longer in back, and probably uh, uh, I, I can say that we see Pomeranians today with too much coat. As a result of that, you trim them severely instead of breeding the right kind of goat. The, the best dog I ever bred was a dog called Ready Teddy. And Teddy was a perfectly square dog with a beautiful tail set. He, but you could not, you, it, it was harsh. Had a gorgeous undercoat. And I see all you guys flipping coats today with a comb. I probably started that because he had this tremendously harsh, thick coat, and you you couldn't. He, he, he was line brush like a poodle, and then between each line, I slicked it to be sure that I kept the undercoat going and coming in. I think part of the problem in not having well, undercoats are bred just like guard hairs are, or outer coat is bred. But I think a lot of times the care of the coat takes out undercoat more than it destroys the outer coat. Personally. How many of you bathe Pomeranians? How many of you bathe a Pomeranian? I can tell you that 60 years ago, almost nobody bathed the Pomeranian. And I was encouraged to do so and fought them all the way, and they were right. A Pomeranian should be clean like any other breed. He, does, he should not be freshly bathed before a dog show, as he should not be freshly trimmed before a dog show. And don't ever trim a dog that you don't have somebody gated for you. See what you've done with a silver, with a thinning shirt. Let somebody gate him. See, 
you know, one of the big problems today is everybody trims down to like the same without understanding or acknowledging what is under the coat that needs to be what the coat's built upon. Any others? Thanks for the privilege. I enjoyed it. Take care.